Hello, and welcome to another uh, Worth Point Chats with Harry Rinker. Today is March 22nd, 2016. I'm Greg Watkins. I'm the editor at worthpoint.com. And uh, today we're talking with Harry Rinker. Uh, where are you today, Harry? Well, actually, it's a tough life, but somebody has to leave it. I am down at the La Playa Resort on North Gulf Shore Drive in Naples. Actually, Excellent. I attempted to do this outside with the ocean in the background, but I thought that'd be a little tacky, But so I'm doing it up in the room. But it is warm but breezy down here. You know, it's uh, one of those weird things when people down here are wearing, wearing uh, sweatshirts and stuff, and I'm saying, hey, I'm from Michigan and hardy, but then you get out there and the wind's blowing, and I'm not as hardy as I think. But no, my wife is down here for a, a board retreat for Davenport University, and so we're along there, but we, you know, we can talk about antiques and collectibles no matter where we are. That's right. So, so we've got a couple of things to talk about today. Uh, a couple of items that uh, viewers have sent in that they want you to look at and let them know what they have, right? Right. And we'll talk about some of the developments going on uh, in the trade right now. Uh, you know, it's very fascinating. We talked earlier a couple of weeks ago about some of the discontinued shows. Uh, in, in New York, and particularly the, uh, the famous pier shows, but now another group has moved into the pier, and will apparently be taking over Pier 94 and running a show, even though the one group has, has discontinued it. That's good news uh, on the whole. The big issue, of course, with so many of these shows is dealer commitment in advance and also getting a younger show promoter to come in there, but uh, it's, it's fun to see it. Uh, there, there was really a lot of People angry. Uh, I, I was reading some of the uh, literature in the uh, April ed edition of the Maine Antique Digest, and a lot of people were saying, "Stop writing so many negative reports about shows closing and and uh, fraud issues in the trade and so forth." On the other hand, that's one of the strengths of the Maine Antique Digest, and also Antique Week too, by the way. Uh, those two papers have been so good in terms of reporting both the positive and the negative side of the antiques and collectibles trade. And you know, we would be fools to think this is only you know, a good news business. This is a business fraught with issues, and if we don't get those issues out there and discussed, then by gosh almighty, uh, you know, uh, we're not doing a service to our people. So we'll talk about some of them uh, from time to time. Uh, you're right, we've got a couple of uh, pieces, and in fact, I let's go to one of them right now. Uh, Barb Jersey, who works with me on uh, the uh, Institute for the Study of Antiques and Collectibles, was having a uh, estate sale. She's an estate sale person and sent me an image of these three chairs and said, well, I had a price on these. And the guy opened, ripped the tag off and said, I don't want them sold. They're worth $1,200 a piece. And, you know, I looked at these and I said, $1,200 a piece for a what? Well, it, you know, this is one of the things, too. People hear things in our business, and if they don't do their homework, you know, um, they can get easily deceived. Now, interestingly enough, I the first thought was that the guy who pulled, the owner who said that they were worth all this money said, well, those are Art Deco chairs. And now, Greg, you took my... Uh, course on furniture design style and I took one look at those and said they may have been made in the 1920s and 30s but they are not art deco design style and this is always fun for me because um, I keep telling people that once a, a de design style enters the furniture vocabulary it stays forever and it can reincarnate itself in some very strange forms now I took one look at these chairs and said aha Queen Anne, at which point I may be the only person on the face of the earth that would think like that. But if you look at these chairs, you will see all the design style elements of a Queen Anne chair. The oxbow crest up at the top, of course, is there. Look at how the uh, splat, splats, that's the outer uh, two arms come down and they're wasted. They pull in there at the waist, almost looks like Gina Lola Bridget or something here, but we won't go there. But anyway, it comes down, of course, it doesn't have a saddle seat, it has a round seat. And it doesn't have a solid splat, that would be the upright thing in, in, uh, at the top, but it's in the three pieces. But, you know, you just have to fill in the hole, and then you have that kind of thing. But the most important thing is to come down and look at the legs. The legs are extended cabriole legs, just as they would be in a Queen Anne chair. 
Well, what's really clever is that uh, little design there uh, of, of the bent uh, stretchers. And believe it or not, you can find some period Queen Anne chairs that have bent stretchers. Now, not quite in that same design. But when you look at that, you, ha you, you cannot help but think to yourself, wow, you know, here is all the elements you might want to find in, in, in a Queen Anne chair done in the 1920s and 30s. Well, so here we have these chairs, and we have to ask ourselves, what could possibly make these things worth a, a great deal of money? Well, we always talk about in the antiques and collectible trade where knowledge is power. And I have to tell you, I didn't know this either until I started researching and thinking, you know, what, you know, originally they were passed off as ice cream parlor trays and, 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 and chairs, ice cream parlor chairs. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, I ate a lot of ice cream in my time and I was in a lot of ice cream parlors. And I don't remember seeing anything that remotely resembled this. So my first thought was, well, they came from a patio set. But then I thought, you know, really, maybe you ought to do some homework. And here's, here's this fun thing, you know. For young collectors today, there are two things that are critical. One, modernist stuff, and two, uh, name identification. If you can put a designer or a manufacturer's name to something and you can uh, have it uh, there, you can run with it. Well, I did some homework and didn't I find out that these chairs are modernist in design, made by the Toledo Metal, Toledo Metal Furniture Company, that's Toledo, Ohio, made by the Toledo Metal Furniture Company. Now, the interesting thing is that company is still in business. This is always one of the others. We're gonna talk about this a little bit later on in terms of the other piece that we're gonna look at too. But that company is still in business. So, and they still make a chair somewhat similar to this one. Now, these chairs were actually drafting chairs, although well, they could have been used in ice cream parlors and so forth, uh, but restored. And these chairs are a long way from being restored. Uh, can sell for in the three fifty to five hundred dollar range a piece. So that you know, fully restored, there could be twelve to fifteen hundred dollars in the set. Certainly not in there. But what? But you know, restoration is one thing. Condition is something else. So this is the thing: is what is the value difference between getting something in the rough like these chairs versus their value uh, restored out there? Well, you know, these chairs raise almost the same dilemma that you're going to get involved in restoration questions with automobiles, Greg. Right? And that is that, you know, if you take a car and you completely sandblast it down to the to the metal and then totally repaint it, period, colors, all the rest of that, well and good, and then you get all a new interior in there and all new leather and all new this, what's left of the of the first car? Nothing. And, and yet they're passed off as full restorations and so forth. So these chairs are going to have to be sandblasted down. Now, I did. Uh, if you go back and look at the seats of the chair, these round seats are almost seem to be somewhat solid. The original earlier versions of these chairs had punched hole seats in them. Uh, you can see the chair on the on the right on my on the right there uh, has like a cross band on there. So I'm not sure if those seats have been replaced. And I'm almost convinced those uh, pillows wound up on the chair at a much later date as well. They were not part of them originally. But so what do you pay for three of these in this condition? Well, first of all, if you're able to get them sandblasted and you're able to match out the colors to historical uh, uh, time, you might pay 25, 50 bucks a piece for them, maybe a hundred and a half, 200 for the set and restore them if you can get $200. But now, or get $1,200, but now you have to ask yourself, how much work do you have to do to do that? I mean, you know, you're not talking about taking a can of stripper paint and stripping them off. You're gonna have them sandblasted, then you gotta match the paint out, then you gotta market them. You know, how many hours and how much time do you have in them? Yeah, you might, you might, uh, you know, triple, quadruple, or maybe even take your money up times 10, but guess what? By the time you get done counting up the number of hours you have involved, the number of costs you have involved, you still may be working for minimum wage. In fact, this is one of the things that always gets me upset in the antiques and collectible business. I don't think we all understand how cheap we are. Or no, how cheaply we're, no, we, well, we're cheap too, I admit that. But, no, but how cheaply we're paid is what I'm trying to trying to refer to. Uh, you know, nobody ever takes into the amount of the cost of overhead and the cost of their time to get this these profit levels. 
And when you do that, maybe it's a wake-up call and you find out that most of us are working for minimum wage or less, actually. Although we're having fun doing it, so I suppose that justifies it. Anyway, so, but, but I mean, that is, that is one of the things that I always, you know, when I, when, I, when I used to teach the business practices course at the Institute for the Study of Antiques and Collectibles, one of the things I always told my, my students is, how much are you worth an hour? What, what are you worth? Are you worth 10 bucks an hour, 35 bucks an hour, 60 bucks an hour, I don't know, a quarter an hour, 200 an hour? Well, hopefully as you get on in time industry, the value of your time goes up. But if you don't factor that time in as part of the cost of acquisition of something, uh, you have a problem. You know, it's, it's like the person that goes to it, an auction is, ah, oh, Harry, he says, I got this great, great drop leaf table for 200 bucks. And I said, fine, what did it cost you? And he said, pay $200 for it. I told you, I said, no, no, no. What, what, what did it cost you? I said, now, how much time was involved? Did it take you two, three, four, five hours to get it? Uh, you know, do you have to haul it home? What did you have to do to it? I said, well, if you got three hours of your time invested in there at a hundred bucks an hour, that's another three hundred dollars. And you got your car in there, and you got the travel time, and you probably, if you had to stay overnight and have breakfast, then you could have five hundred dollars on top of the original. Two. You could have six hundred bucks in that table. If you can't sell it for eight hundred, eight hundred to a thousand, you're in trouble. He said, but I could get four hundred bucks for it. I said, welcome to my world. But no, it's, well, well it, it's a hard thing because what happens is that historic, historically, forget the people that are in antiques magazines and so forth. Historically, collecting and a lot of the early doing was called a hobby. And a hobby had nothing to do with money. A hobby was just fun to do, and, and if you made a little bit, and you did. In fact, most of the early dealers were collector dealers, and I, I tell them they, they sold in to, make, to pay for their habit of buying stuff. And I think a lot of them did. A lot of them were retired, and they, they just used the business as a tax write-off. But a lot of us strongly believe that if you're going to get in this business and be successful, you need business plans, you need you know one-year, two-year, three-year plans, you need mission statements, and you also need a sense of, you know, are you making a profit or aren't you in terms of this? And the old rule when you're out buying antiques is double your money pay your bills, triple your money, pay yourself. So, I mean, it's, it's a strange kind of thing. Well, here I am rambling on again. See how we can take those chairs and go in a million different directions with them. But it was fun to see them. I haven't heard from her about what she did finally get from her, even if the person let her sell them. I, I told Barbara, if he feels that strongly about it, just give them to him. Let him sell them himself. He'll, get, he'll learn fast enough. <laughs> well, well, you know, that, that is a question about... Uh, people who are in it for business and people who are in it for a hobby. And if you, if you rely on what you see on reality TV, everybody's in it to, to make a, a quick score and a turnaround. And your advice about putting, you know, calculating how much your time is worth and, and what it's going to cost to uh, restore the piece. But if you're a hobbyist and you find uh, a table that needs some work and, and you put it in your garage and, and you spend your hours uh, refinishing it and, you know that you want to put this piece in your home, then then you're going to enjoy that piece, and the, the cost doesn't really matter, right? Well, okay, yeah, yeah, but it does. I, I mean, in, that's right. It's supposed to never be about the money. You know what the one true test is for any collector when it's not about the money? They die with their stuff. That's the only moment in time when it's not about the money. Seriously, uh, I mean, it, it's it's a hard, it's it's a very very hard call with all of this. But you know. Those pit the pickers, okay? Pickers would be making a dime if they had to rely on their ability to pick. They're getting paid by the television company to film that series. That's how they're getting the expenses to do that. Let me tell you. Uh, it's, it's just like, you know, television's entertainment. And let's face it, it is the, uh, the, pawn, the pawn stars, that show, you know, what's yes. the mathematical probability of people walking into a place in the middle of Las Vegas with all that great stuff. And then what is the equal mathematical possibility that just so happens that a few minutes later in through the door walks some expert that can talk about it? Yeah, right. Get a life. <laughs> all, all entertainment. Well, we all have to believe that, uh, that what we're watching on TV is, is uh, scripted on those reality yeah. shows. So, so if, you're, if you're watching that and, and, and yeah. surprised at the providence, uh, of the providence of, uh, oh, this is exactly what I was looking for. 
uh, here in the middle of Las Vegas. Uh, how did I ever just stumble upon it? Well, it was because it was written into the script. Well, the thing about it is that, you know, I think that's the heart and soul of Americans, that they want to believe and that they're trusting. But the key to survival in the antiques and collections is to question what everybody tells you, including me, uh, seriously. Well, anyway, uh, let's talk about some things that are going on. You've got uh, you've been making some big advancements with the uh, marks uh, at, uh, area in 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 Worth. But we haven't talked about that, and I think it's time we at least let some of our viewers know that that there's some interesting things going on here. Yes, uh, Worth Point has. Um has really bulked up our marks and digital library product. Now, WorthPoint started with the Worthopedia, which is the, the price database. And there are more than 300 million individual pieces uh, of sales data. And these come from auction houses around the country as well as online retailers like uh, eBay. But our uh, marks library, which we are now calling MAPS, uh, an acronym for uh, marks, autographs, patterns, and symbols. We now have uh, 100,000 different marks, patterns, autographs, and symbols that you can search by keyword uh, and bring up the, uh, the marks. If, if you have a piece of silver and you can see what the marks look like, you can put those keywords in and it will show you all the marks that the keywords match. And if you subscribe to the uh, Marks and Library service, then you can see all the details as to the company, where, where it was located, when those marks were used, and possibly even the, um, the craftsman who created that piece. And uh, we're expanding now past the marks to things like China patterns, glass patterns, all that carnival glass and, and um, uh, iridescent glass and milk glass, all of those things now uh, we have in the patterns section. And then symbols as well as like company symbols, uh, their trademark logos, things like that. Uh, and the, the depth of the marks is pretty amazing. Uh, well, not, not just the marks, but uh, if you come across a military medal, right? You've got the little uh, metal rod with the ribbon and then the, the metal below it. You put the keywords in on that and we've got a very deep list of those uh, metals. So you can, you can tell exactly what it is, not just uh, United States military medals and not just military medals, but things that were handed out as, uh, as awards for doing whatever it is that you did best. Yeah, I think one of the keys here, too, is that remember, a mark is only a starting point in the identification process. So unfortunately, for all of us in the trade, a lot of fake marks, have, a lot of marks have been fake. There's been a lot of problems. You know, the one thing you have to understand when you're authenticating antiques and collectibles, and Greg was in the authenticating course we taught at the Institute in the 2015 summer camp, is that Greg learned that you, the piece has to be right in every sense, in every sense of the word. The mark is just one particular part of it. I, I just learned last week, I hate, I'm very sad and actually, uh, I'm working on a project, Greg, called Forgotten Giants, the individuals that shaped this trade by writing some of the best reference books and that. I just, in my record on collectibles column, I just wrote about a gentleman named Henry J. Kaufman, who did a lot of pioneering work in early uh, tools and, and uh, Pennsylvania German material, and also wrote about a wonderful gentleman from uh, New England called George Michaels, who had the first television show on antiques and collectibles called Antiques for PBS long before any of the rest of us ever made uh, the television screen. But in uh, search of this, I was working on uh, trying to find information about an individual named Dorothy Hammond. Now, uh, you, you should know Dorothy Hammond's name because you were told about her uh, and her book, Confusing Collectibles. You have a number of copies in the library down there at, at Worth Point on that. And Dorothy was in, Dorothy along with Ruth Webb Lee were two of the most influential people in terms of documenting reproduction material from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I got a lot of bio information on it, but no information on her death. They finally tracked down one of her sons last week 
and Fallon, unfortunately, at Dorothy passed away in 2014. Uh, it, it, you know, these are names that mean so much to me because these were the books that I cut my teeth on in the trade. I mean, today it's more likely if you're into the issue of reproductions, you know about Mark Chavenko, although it's been a while now since Mark, uh, he took down his Repro News site and discontinued his publication. His book, Krause still has his books in prints, but they're still there. But, you know, this is a case where knowledge is power, but understanding this, but having a place to start. I mean, you need a place to start. Now, when you get a mark and you identify a piece by the mark, then the question you have to ask very simply is, is this piece indicative of the company that made it? Is it the same quality? Is it what we might expect? Uh, in Dorothy Hammond's book, uh, she shows pictures where you could buy sheets of fake RS pressure marks. And there, I ran across at one point in my research in advertising where you could get uh, fake stamps of glass companies and then all you had to do is dip them in acid and put them on the bottom of any piece of glass you wanted. And then there was a while when they used those vibrating guns to false mark all that Tiffany and Kubla and, and Quizelle glass and that type of thing. Well, anyway, we, we, we've got another image I wanted to talk about that we got in from uh, one of our uh, uh, people. And again, by the way, before we do that, we want to tell you that we're here to answer any questions you might have about this. And we have a, a place you can send uh, a question about an object you might have that you'd like us to talk about. Don't send them to me. Send them to this address uh, on the screen. Here you are, community at worthpoint.com. If you'd like to submit an item for me to identify and evaluate, send your photographs and everything you know about the item to community at worthpoint.com. Now, what does it mean by, by photographs? We hope you will take at least one image of the object itself and then as many details as possible, including marks, any damage and so forth. That's very important uh, to us. And then tell us exactly what you know. How did you acquire it? Well, I bought it at auction. Well, if you bought it at auction, tell us how much you paid for it. Maybe you set a record price. Uh, you know, put something in those photographs that will show scale, like like a uh, dollar bill or a ruler or a quarter or something to let us do that. Well, anyway, let's go uh, to the, the images that came in here uh, that we're going to talk about. It happens to be a lighted globe. I got uh, a, an email from someone said, I have this uh, globe. We bought it for 50 bucks at auction. Now, you know, I always think sometimes when people send me these things, they want me to tell them that they, that they got a good deal. But this is a globe of the world on this nice wooden stand, uh, and it, it lights up when you put it in. Now, I want to thank this person. They must have sent me a dozen pictures or more of this globe, but the one that they sent me that was really helpful was the one that said heirloom globe by the name of the company that made it. And here you are. This was on their 16-inch diameter heirloom globe. Now, I'm always one of these fans, just, just like with those uh, Toledo Art Metal uh, uh, Toledo Metal Furniture uh, Chairs, I always assume the company may still in business, and believe it or not, this is a company that's still in business. It was started by a husband and wife, and their goal was to put a globe in every home, a, a, a notable goal, and they still make a globe that looks exactly like this, with that same wooden stand and, and that same lighted interior and so forth. Now, this globe has got some age to it, so the people that sent me this sent me an image of the, the map that was on the globe. And would you believe that, that the company has a website, www.replog, no, R-E, well, we'll have to go back to that slide to see how to spell their name. But yeah, there, there it is, www.replogle.com. And if you go up on that website, there's this wonderful, I think it's like four or five page list of the changing names of, of areas. And so you can type in uh, keywords on the map and, and you would get there. For example, if you if the map said Rhodesia, then you know it had to be before 1980 because in 1980 Rhodesia became Zimbabwe. Well, this map looks like it, uh, you know, with the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Well, there's <laughs> so much for that anymore. Uh, and then down there's, and, and it's not showing because uh, Kazakhstan and some of the rest of them as, as independent states. And so uh, chances are, you know, judging from this, that this is from the 1950s. Now, a new one of these costs anywhere from around $1,000 new. 
getting one in with the same wooden stand with a new globe. Uh, but the thing about it is now, what value, if any, does is there created by the fact that the map is not brand new? Well, if if you want the piece for decorative value, conversation value, just for fun, then by all means, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the date of the map doesn't make any difference because you're just doing it for the fun of the conversation value, and part of the conversation value actually rests in the old map. Now. They paid 50 bucks for this, and there are a group of them almost identical to this one up on eBay for about the $200, $250 range, and that's the asking price. That doesn't mean it's the getting price. But anyway, the long and the short of it is that, you know, their 50 bucks was a good deal. Now, on the other hand, if you want this to be a functional globe for your kids, don't buy it. <laughs> they need a new one. I, well, the thing I, the thing I didn't do, the thing I didn't do was uh, – Double check uh, to see whether they, the company provides replacement globes as the world changes, which it seems to do on a regular basis these days. But I've known for a while that there's been a strong interest in, 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 in desk size and, and, and floor models like this world globes among collectors. Uh, you know, you couldn't give them away before, and I, I mean, I think they got a great buy at 50 bucks. But I was uh, in an antique mall uh, in Florida uh, a couple of weeks, uh, uh, yeah, just last a couple of days ago, and as I walked in the door, there was a metal one. You know, the standard metal one on the on a desk. It has, you know, like the like the half curve of the globe is floating around it. Then it has a right. base on the bottom. Right. Well, they were asking fifty bucks for that, and that seems about right to me on a secondary market. So there's there's still an interest in globes out there, a nice collecting interest in in globes. Well, there we have that one. Well, I want to get a plug in here. We're nearing the end of this week's conversation again from my Institute for the Study of Antiques and Collectibles. We're taking reservations, and they're coming in for the 2016 summer camp, actually, uh, July 11th through the 16th. These are three two-day courses. The first uh, two-day course is called Researching Antiques and Collectibles. It's a companion course to the authenticating course. It's designed to talk about all the textbooks, all the reference sources, both online and and in print for all the major collecting categories. I'm going to have fun doing it because it's just, it's just like a refresher course for me to know where I'm going on. But I'm also in checking the internet, learning a lot of new, fun, modern sites that are out there. And wow, there are some great sites out there now. Not as easy to use as a book, but still in all they're out there and, and, and available if you know what you're doing. Second course is on paintings, prints, and watercolors. Uh, a, a really great subject. The final course, of course, toys, games, and puzzles. And I don't care if anybody comes to that. I'll just teach it anyway. No, I love toys, games, and, and puzzles. In fact, speaking of toys, games, and puzzles, I want to call your attention. I know we do this from time to time to a book that I just uh, I had the privilege of reading and had the author. Uh, many of you may know that I do What You Got, which is a syndicated antiques and collectibles show on Sunday mornings from 8 to 10 Eastern time. And I had uh, on the phone from England, Alan Hickling. He is the author of Toy Forts and Toy, not, not Toy, toy Forts, no. <laughs> Careful toy Forts and Castles, European-made toys of the 19th and 20th centuries. I had the privilege of seeing a number of these over the years as I went to toy shows. And my good friend, Dave Bausch, who is a big toy collector in the Allentown area, has several of them in his collection. But this was a real insider look at these forts uh, that were mostly from the end of the 19th through about the 1950s, 60s. He, do, he doesn't have a chapter on the American stuff. I told him I was proud of him that he didn't put those Tinny Marks, Marks forts in, but the, the truth of the matter is that these were, these were not, these were, these were actually toys for kids. I mean, they're not they're collected by high-end adults. Book, toy forts and castles, European-made toys, of the 19th and 20th centuries uh, from Schiffer Publications, cost us 60 bucks. But I have to tell you, it is a major new addition to the literature, and I was excited that a great fellow enjoyed talking with him, uh, uh, years of research. You know, it's one thing to publish a price picture guide and all the rest of that, but to publish a guide with detailed research about manufacturers and so forth, that makes a great reference book, and this is a fine reference book from uh, that point of view. Well, we'll do this again next week, sir, at about uh, the same time, on uh, Tuesday afternoon about 2. We encourage people to go up to YouTube at that time and watch us do it. And we do have a uh, 
ongoing a chat system up there. Nobody seems to chat with us, but nevertheless, they're welcome to do that at the time. Also, let's get that screen up again, where if you have an object or something you'd like to talk to us about, we have a uh, an email address that you can send us, community at worthpoint.com, if I remember correctly. There we go. It's coming up here. Yep, community at worthpoint.com. Get that in there. Well, I hate to tell you this, but the wind's died down and the sun is out. It's time for me, you would think, to go to the beach. But no, the Tiki Bar by the beach is where I'm heading. The, the Tiki Bar is a great destination, Harry. I wish I could join you. All right. Well, we'll talk again Sounds good, Harry. Oh, well, taking us out of here now. All right. See you next week, Harry. Yeah.